Hello, I'm Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another edition of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics. Today, I wanted to do a quick math exercise with all of you to try to figure out what the attraction really is to psilocybin mushrooms as medicine. And I don't mean from the perspective of a shamanic use or a traditional use or an entheogenic use. Those excuses and reasons have existed for thousands of years, and those of us in the know understand what that's all about. Rather, what I'm talking about is what's all the interest suddenly by investors. And you may be aware there are a number of for-profit entities certainly investigating and exploring psilocybin and eagerly looking at things like what's happening in Canada right now and what's happening in Oregon, hoping to create some sort of a licit psilocybin mushroom market. But that got me thinking, what exactly would that market look like and what exactly is the attraction? And I suppose that depends on, on how one goes about defining who can and can't use psilocybin in some sort of a re-regulation. Now, the lead, of course, is medical because there are obviously medical benefits to psilocybin mushrooms. And again, you don't need modern science to tell you that. You've got thousands of years of historical record and shamanic tradition to confirm what scientists are now also confirming. Uh, really, ultimately, what we're talking about is getting the regulators to uh, pay attention as well. And unfortunately, most regulators don't look at history or shamans, but they will occasionally listen to scientists. So science must lead, and lead it does. But right behind the scientists are a, a bunch of investors. And the question, of course, is why? And the answer is always money with, with investors. Uh, people don't generally invest in altruism, because altruism only pays you back in love and good deeds. It doesn't put dollars in your pocket. And unfortunately, there are people who need dollars. Uh, so what attracts them? What, what is bringing dollars into the field of psilocybin? So that got me thinking, and I have a spreadsheet that I've opened up that I haven't filled anything out yet, but I wanted to do this exercise with you to try to hypothecate what the answer might be. And leading into that spreadsheet, I, I'm also going to point out that I did a little bit of research and found that on, on the open illicit market, um, one might look at Amsterdam and say illicit market, psilocybin mushrooms sell for on average about $10 a gram. I don't know if that's a reasonable metric when one has a illicit market, but I could see the prices going wildly in either direction up or down. For example, in the case of the Johns Hopkins psilocybin study, I read some quote that they were paying upwards of $7,000 a gram. I want to say that again because, yeah, that was a shocking number. $7,000 a gram. Uh, I can't fathom that's what's going to be in some sort of future illicit market, so that's not a reliable number either. I think mostly that price comes from the fact that there are so many hurdles and regulations that block licit psilocybin production that, of course, the price is artificially high. So as between all this, I'm going to lean back towards the $10 a gram price and use that for this example. So let's start with that. I'm going to actually take my glasses off so I can see my screen here while I type. But let's, uh, let's set a price at $10 a gram. And now let's also assume, uh, well, we don't have to assume. We know the United States population is roughly 370 million. I'm just going to round it down to 350 million. And we'll put that up on the board as well. So we've got 350 million people. And then we're also going to apply a uh, reduction to that number based on a percentage of persons who, in a medical context, might qualify for a psilocybin program. So what I'm looking at are people who are regarded as uh, suffering some sort of an anxiety disorder or depression or, or the equivalent. And if you look at places uh, that are studying psilocybin right now, like Johns Hopkins, that's exactly the, the maladies that they're aimed at. So let's just assume that's the limit of the potential pool of people who could qualify for psilocybin consumption under some theoretical new law. So right now, the statistic that seems to be popularly uh, agreed upon is that roughly one in five people fits in that category, which, by the way, is a shocking statistic uh, but nonetheless, valid. So one in five, that's 20%. But 
but let's be super conservative with our numbers here and let's reduce that by by a, a factor. So let's let's say it's one in ten, or excuse me, let's say it's ten percent. So let's make that on the board at ten percent of the population. So ten percent instead of twenty percent of the population takes us from three hundred and fifty million down to thirty five million. Now of the thirty five million people who could qualify under some sort of a hypothecated psilocybin program, how many would actually participate? Maybe 10% of them. So let's reduce our pool further from 35 million down to 3.5 million. Okay, so nationally now we have conservatively, a pool of 3.5 million people who we assume would qualify for psilocybin therapies and who we assume would be interested in participating. Okay, so 3.5 million people. If they were to purchase a single gram, and again, we assumed at the beginning of all this it was $10 a gram, that's $35 million. Okay. That's enough to attract some business, but not a lot of business, if all you're doing is buying one gram. But that's not the model here. I suppose if we're talking uh, a future where psilocybin mushrooms are just unrestricted and wide open for all to consume, well, of course, that's a massive market. That's literally everybody's potential customer, and, and people naturally will advertise the products and try to scoop up as much market share as they can. But... In a different scenario, if, for example, things continue along as uh, they are at the moment in a pure medical world, pure medical model, and if that's where they stay, at least for an interim period, then you have to look at the smaller pool and do the math and figure out what that pool is and, and what it presents both in population and dollars. So I think that in the medical model, there's going to be two types of patients, principally. Probably varieties, but two principal types. I think type one is going to be sort of the, the, the big dose, occasional patient who's going to do some sort of a, I don't know, anywhere between two and five gram uh, session, but not frequently. Probably once every quarter or half a year, or maybe once a year, or maybe just once because for a lot of people, a single deep dive dose kind of fixes what's wrong. At least that's what's reported. But there's this other model as well, which is the daily or weekly microdoser. And dosages are, are exactly what's being explored right now for determination what's the right amount for the right person under the right circumstance. And from what I'm seeing, there seems to be a lot of chatter in the forums that roughly about a half a gram every day or two uh, is um, about, on average, what people describe that they are taking. So if you hypothecate that to two grams per week and you multiply that by 52 weeks in a year, that's 104 grams. We'll round for ease of the math here. Just call it 100 grams per patient per year. So if you're charging a $10 per gram price and you're consuming 100, well, it's $1,000 a year. Now you take that $1,000 per year, and if you could assume that your approximate 3.5 million patients out there uh, would all be microdosers at $1,000 a patient per year, the numbers start to stack up pretty quick. Now you're back into the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues. So it's not difficult to see that even under a medical model, there are opportunities for investors to make money in psilocybin. I do want to remind everyone that this is natural medicine that's got a long, rich history of use amongst a variety of cultures around the world and used for a lot of the same reasons that medicine is now exploring it. So... Just keep that in mind. Now, most likely psilocybin therapies are going to probably be some variety of both deep dosage and micro dosage. 
what the numbers ultimately turn out, everybody's speculating. Nobody knows. If anybody tells you right now today they have the answers to those questions, just laugh at them and walk away. Nobody knows. But it's not difficult to sort of project because there are some numbers you can look at. But precision right now, you might as well be throwing darts blindfolded. Aside from identifying the patient base and establishing pricing, which of course is going to be impacted by the costs of production, there's going to be competition in that arena as well. So there's probably going to be, of course, those who advocate for just the actual psilocybin mushroom, ingest it intact and enjoy whatever entourage effect is a result of the variety of of chemicals and alkaloids that exist inside that mushroom naturally, as contrasted with consuming just isolated psilocybin. And isolated psilocybin has been around for decades. It does not need to be invented. The methods already exist, and synthesized psilocybin is already a thing. Um, Indeed, last year, I remember reading an article about some group of scientists who actually were able successfully to splice a psilocybin production gene into living bacteria, and those bacteria now thrive and multiply, and (laughs) their waste product is psilocybin, which in turn raises an interesting uh, thought. Psilocybin in the wild grow in feces, and if this future bacteria is the source of psilocybin, well, that will, from a certain perspective, be the bacteria's feces. So I guess it all comes full circle. Uh, Either way, Patients may have a choice or may not. They may be limited to the natural mushroom. They may be limited to some sort of a synthetic. They may be limited to an extract. Don't know. Whichever is ultimately to take the lead is is difficult to know. Obviously, if you go in in an industrial capacity, you have to be able to scale up production and also maintain consistency. And in a natural product, that's very difficult to achieve. Um, in my experiences in the cannabis industry, that has certainly been the case with cannabis. Cannabis out in the wild is exceedingly difficult to grow with consistency. Now, you can create some beautiful plants that have wonderful, wonderful, wonderful features, but duplicating it consistently, that's difficult, which is why most industrial-level cannabis cultivators do it indoors under extreme controlled conditions and stick principally to clonal propagation rather than seed. In point of fact, seed is kind of frowned upon these days. But uh, I like the old classical stuff myself, so I have a warm fuzzy in my heart for seed-grown land race, and I, uh, I hope it is a protected thing because there are a lot of threats to land race species now because of the cannabis industry. But there's a lesson to be taken for the future psilocybin industry from cannabis, because cannabis has discovered that cultivation is not as easy as everybody originally thought, particularly when you're scaling up to markets as massive as an entire nation when you didn't have anything to begin with. To sum up this back-of-the-envelope quick math, I think it's easy to imagine a market that could be worth well over $100 million in the United States for just medically restricted psilocybin use. Imagine what that market could be if it were opened more broadly. And this is true whether you're talking microdosers or limited-use deep dosers. I think that the numbers all tend to suggest this. Now, for those at home who kind of look at this in, in disgust or, or disdain for the, the capitalistic aspects of this, I, I would caution you all to keep in mind that without investment, a lot of this doesn't happen, and you have to kind of make peace with both worlds. If, for example, there were no psilocybin industry, no investors, then where would the psilocybin mushrooms come from? Well, okay, people would home cultivate. But I think it's easy to conclude most people don't have the knowledge or desire to do it. I think that most regulators would not want unrestricted, untracked 
cultivation taking place in their cities and suburbs. I think that they'd want to have some at least base knowledge of what's going on. And, of course, the opportunity to tax it because you want people to actually be inspired to do things like engage in, in experiments with different cultivation techniques, uh, different propagation techniques, different types of um, crossbreeding, and different types of cultivation methods so that yields can be increased and quality can be increased and consistency can be achieved. And in a world without investment, you're just not going to get there. But this is why now, today, at the inception of this awakening to psilocybin is the time for advocates and for charities and for nonprofits to bring their powers to bear to make sure that the regulations that do get created and the laws that do get enacted maintain a level of care and compassion for every individual so that what's happening right now in Canada and what may happen in, imminently in Oregon can be repeated and maintained across the country. Money can bring good things as well as bad. It's how you use the tools that matter. I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of Psychedelic Alex. The book is available now on Amazon, and I do hope you subscribe to this show. You can also find me on Facebook as well as on my website, psychedelicalex.com. Thanks. Thank you.